the first lecture of the seminar is for introducing the very basics, the gravity equation and the Kepler law. Actually, we will derive the Kepler laws from the first one. Let's see how. The gravitational law discovered by Newton says mass times acceleration is equal to the gravity force. That force is proportional to the product of the masses of the bodies and inverse to the square of the distance. Moreover, the force is directed along the line that connects the bodies. The negative sign says the force is attractive. That equation is vectorial, also three scalar ones. The universal gravitational constant capital G is 6.67 into 10 to minus 11 cubic meter per kilogram per square second. We refer now to a planar motion and we introduce a fixed frame x, y, z and a mobile frame e1, e2, e3. Now we write the expression of the velocity and acceleration. The velocity is the derivative of the position vector with respect to the time. The position vector is made of a scalar part r and the vectorial part r hat that is a versor. The derivation of r hat is the cross product between the angular velocity omega of the mobile frame and the versor itself that is due to the Poisson theorem. Omega is normal to the motion plane, oriented as per E3. Therefore, the derivative of R hat is theta dot into theta hat. The expression of the velocity is written here, one component along E1 and one along E2. The acceleration is the derivative of the velocity with respect to the time. And remembering that the derivative of theta hat versus time is omega cross theta hat, that turns into minus theta dot into r hat, we can write the expression of the acceleration consisting of five terms. Now we group the components along E1 and the ones along E2. We find the expression in red and blue respectively. In case of Newton law, the acceleration has only a component along R and the component along theta is zero because the force is only radial. Since the Newton force is always directed versus the central body, we can demonstrate that the angular momentum is constant. For definition, the angular momentum H is the cross product between R and V. It refers to the unitary mass. The two derivatives on the right hand side are both zero since the vectors are parallel each other. And since h is constant, we can calculate it at once. We find r square theta dot into k versor. That means that h is a vector perpendicular to the plane of the motion. The first Binet formula says theta dot equals h divided r square. The component of the velocity along r is r dot that we can express in that form introducing the derivative with respect to theta. We split the derivative into two parts. By plugging the first Binet formula, we find this expression on the right side, that is the second Binet formula. The velocity component along theta is r times theta dot, therefore h over r, that is the third Binet formula. The acceleration when central force is just radial. We have seen its expression at slide number four. And now we replace the expression of theta dot from the first Binet formula. And 
we introduce also the second Binet formula for the expression of R dot. Moreover, we split the derivative of R dot over time into derivative of R dot over theta times derivative of theta over time. That is, once again, the first Binet formula. Altogether, we get this expression in red. That is the fourth Binet formula. The task of the Binet formulas is to express velocity and acceleration as function of the geometrical parameters only r and theta without the time any longer, and we actually succeeded. Thanks to the Binet formulas, we can now demonstrate the Keplero laws once by one. Let's start from the second. The second says about the irular speed. The irular speed is defined as the orbital area covered by the celestial body over the time. The elementary area is defined as one half of r times r into theta dot. But this is actually the half of the angular momentum thanks to the first Binet formula. Since h is constant over the orbit, we have demonstrated that the irular speed is constant. Let's come back now to the Newton law. If we eliminate the mass of the small body and we call me the product of capital G and capital M, we can write that negative me over r square is equal to a, the acceleration, but a is only radial. By plugging in the fourth Binet formula, we get the second derivative of 1 over r with respect to theta plus 1 over r is equal to me over h square. We call 1 over p that value. And now we call eta the function 1 over r, and we can write a nice second order linear differential equation. This equation we can solve. We need just the initial conditions. And they are two, one for eta and one for eta prime. Let's consider now the initial conditions for theta r and for the velocity. We say that for theta equals zero, r is r p. We are in this position. We say also that the velocity is perpendicular to the radius. Also, there is no component along r, and the component along theta is omega rp, where omega is the local angular velocity. Those conditions we need to translate for the function eta. Eta zero is one over r for theta equals zero, and that is one over rp. Eta prime is for definition the derivative of 1 over r with respect to theta. That is, from the second Binet formula, negative vr over h. But this is zero for the initial conditions. The general solution of the ordinary differential equation is eta equals a times sinus of theta plus alpha plus 1 over p. Its derivative is a times cosine of theta plus alpha. The initial conditions say eta for theta 0 must be 1 over rp, and eta prime must be 0. We have also two equations in the two unknowns a and alpha. We can get alpha equals pi half and a equals p minus rp over p times rp. We can eventually write the solution 
eta function of theta as this one, remembering that eta is 1 over r. Then if we reciprocate that function, we find this expression. If we call e the ratio between p minus rp over p, that is a pure number, then we recognize that uh, this function is a conic in polar coordinates. Eventually, the first Kepler law is satisfied. The planet's orbits are elliptical, being the Sun its focus. What is the meaning of P? For theta equals pi half, R is equal to P. P we call the semilatus rectum. By introducing the major semiaxis A, the radius of the periapsis is A times E minus 1, and the radius of the apoapsis is A times E plus 1. So for theta equals pi, that is the position of the apoapsis, we get R equals P over 1 minus e. And if we combine the two expressions, we find the value of p being a times 1 minus e square. Let's write now the trajectory equation we have found using p and e. If we make the inverse and then the second derivative over theta, we get this expression. And this expression we want to plug in into the fourth Binet formula for the radial acceleration. The result is this expression in red that we can compare with the value of the acceleration given by the Newton law and that allows to write a simple relationship between h and p. Since the orbit is a conic, it can be an ellipse, a parabola, or a hyperbola. Assuming to deal with an ellipse, the only closed path, what is the time for a complete orbit? The area of the ellipse is pi times a times b, where b, the minor semi-axis, we can express as function of a and e. And finally, we get such a formula. Moreover, from the second Kepler law, we know that the annular speed is constant and equals h half. Let's plug now the expression of h we found in the previous slide. We get an expression for the annular speed depending upon a and E only, apart from me, which is a constant for the planet. The annular speed is also the total area divided by the total time, that is the period that we are looking for. That means that the period is given by this expression. If we make the square, we get the third Kepler law. The square of the period is proportional to the cube of the semi-axis of the orbit. Thanks to Kepler. See you next time.